Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Millie Herod and I am the membership manager here at the National Flute Association. And we are so excited to be kicking off our new series that is being led by our IDEA committee. Um, and um, uh, Paul Gudmundson, who uh, is the co-chair for that committee is here with us. And um, we are so excited that you're gonna be joining us tonight. We are going to have two events in the future. Um, um, of the series. I will put more of that information as a link in the chat, just so you can make sure and register for the upcoming sessions. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and um, give the mic over to Paula to have her introduce our guest. Also, my name, my pronouns are she, her. <laughs> Forgot to say that, but... All right, thank you so much, Millie, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I'm really excited um, to present our first of three um, presenters for this series that was made possible by an endowment grant from the National Flute Association. Um, and this is put on by the IDEA Committee, um, the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Committee. So we've invited three leaders of um, three organizations we think you should know about, and they they are doing amazing things in their own organizations and really connecting um, with them is kind of our hope and that they'll share um, their wisdom and their experiences with us. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Vanessa, who is actually lives in Minnesota, but we've never met in person. <laughs> um, uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing you to Vanessa Rose, who is, leads the American Composers Forum. Um, she's been leading the American Composers Forum since January 20. 2019. Um, so for more than a decade, Vanessa has been working with artists and organizations dedicated to living creators, including the International Contemporary Ensemble, um, the Lark Play Development Center, the Knights Collective, and the American Composers Orchestra and the Arco uh, Collaborative. Um, she's led organizations through significant transition, establishing new leadership positions, guiding strategic transformation, and centering racial equity. Um, she's the board chair of the Performing Arts Alliance, a coalition of national performing arts organizations focusing in, on public policy and advocacy to ensure equitable participation in the arts. I'm familiar with um, Vanessa through her work through the American Composers Forum, and um, I've, I've seen some of the, the things that she's done to kind of recenter some of the work in the American Composers Forum and to really kind of take on issues of equity and diversity in the arts and um, definitely came to mind and I'm really excited to have her um, to kind of lead us in this conversation. So um, Vanessa has a presentation. We'll take some questions during the presentation and then we'll have an opportunity for everybody um, to kind of engage and ask conversations um, after the presentation. So thank you for joining us, uh, Vanessa, and you can take it away. Thank you so much, Paula, and to the committee for the invitation. I'm so honored to be here. I hope my journey is helpful to all of you um, and really look forward to engaging you. I def definitely don't want to be the only person talking, so really look forward to a real dialogue, um, your questions and, and recommendations perhaps as well. Um, and thank you to everybody at NFA for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to go kind of back and forth. I've got like a PowerPoint presentation. So um, I figure on Zoom, sometimes it's nice just to look at something. You don't need to see my face the whole time. So I'm going to jump into that, but then I will stop and, and make sure that we're Kind of uh, on the same page. And again, as Paula mentioned, you know, we're happy to have questions throughout. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit about me. I'm hoping everybody can see the screen. Yes, let me know if not. Um, and Paula, if you see things in the chat, maybe you can let me know as well, because I won't be able to see that easily. Great. All right. So you know a little bit about me. Thank you for reading my bio. Funny to be standing here listening to my bio. So yeah, I've got um, a few different things I've done in my my life. Um, I use she her pronouns. I identify as a white woman and a mom. Um, I like to call myself a change agent. I am a Western classical violinist. I studied in conservatory, a um, couple degrees there. I come from a family of classical musicians, and I bring that up because I think it's important to note that I am somebody that comes from a very 
Eurocentric, Western classical focused um, background. It was very much part of my my upbringing and my home and my family. I am only the only one of all my siblings who went into that as a profession, but definitely a, a very um, major foundation of, of my, my background. Um, and I have had this administrative career for over 20 years, spanning orchestras, operas, theaters, new music ensembles, artist collectives, art service organizations, variety of different art forms, as well as budget sizes and locations. And just for fun, I offered that I also love summer. It's my favorite season. And I like accessorizing with shoes, which is why I picked this particular photo. So you can see my shoes because you can't see it right now. Uh, right. So. So how does somebody who's obviously white and a Eurocentric upbringing studying violin end up doing this work? And to be honest, I don't know where it actually started. Um, I don't know when I started to recognize um, race among my community, but I do know that it was very much accelerated by leaving classical music when I went into working in theater. So this is a bit over 10 years ago, working with the Playwright Center, where it was very much committed to um, not only offering um, a stage for sharing perspectives because that's what theater does, right? They're stories. You're hearing stories from different people's experiences, but intentionally highlighting those who have been marginalized or excluded. Um, alongside that, we had internally training, which was a first for me, where we started to talk about, you know, equity and racial equity in particular. So that really kind of, I, I, like I said, accelerated and initiated a much more uh, focused effort um, for me personally. And I took that through, you know, future um, jobs and really just that aspect of, of the training, of course, helping, but my own reading, listening, observing, starting to notice things around me, starting to identify as a white woman. Like I identified as a woman before, but I don't think I'd actually said that I'm white, <laughs> you know, out loud um, before this work. Um, and then, you know, just that evolution continues. You, I started to ask questions. I started to challenge assumptions and being aware of that defaulting, um, particularly in our classical music training, you know, we're very much focused on, um, you know, the Eurocentric Western classical canon. Our training is often about achieving perfection, about our individual um, achievements, even if we're working in chamber music or different ensembles. And all, a lot of that really stems from this um, similar mindset of not being aware of, of people around you, not being aware of differences, not making space for differences, and that really, really narrow kind of focused work that we are we train to, to do, to be able to perfect our craft. Um, alongside this, I'm going to bring this up a lot. I mean, just this idea of being vulnerable, um, being uncomfortable. I feel a little uncomfortable talking about this in front of all of you. I haven't met most of you. You don't know, really know me, but here we are diving into this very, very complex subject. And I know how important it is to put myself in a position of being vulnerable. And I, I do very much hope that um, you will provide feedback to me if you feel that there's something that I've, you know, misunderstood or, or um, misinterpreted. Uh, and Ultimately, consistency builds trust. I mean, you know, we're all entering this work from a different place. And this is something we talk about a lot at, at ECF. You know, this this is now, I've been there five years and it's because we've been super consistent about this continued effort with a lot of learning and mistakes along the way, but that consistency is what is going to give people a sense of um, that you're authentically in, interested in doing this and that you're, be, be, you're able to build the trust in relationships. And of course, showing up is important for that and showing up with grace and gratitude for feedback. So disclaimer, I'm not a consultant. Like this is not my like job <laughs> to do equity work. There are many, many amazing um, you know, organizations and people out there that do this. I'm just somebody who's like trying to figure this out and um, very, very grateful that I've been able to work with a number of people who do do this work and a number of people who are part of my community who um, provide me with incredible um, you know, feedback and, and um, reflection. So I'm gonna just walk through a few terms and then I'm gonna stop the presentation and, and check in with you all because I can't see anybody. Um, but I think it's really important, this actually comes straight out of our statement and you can see the link there at the bottom 
at ACF, it's really important that we're talking about the same thing. And these are just few of the glossary terms that we have in our statement, but in the interest of time, I just pulled out a few. Um, we talk about anti-racism at ACF, and this actually comes out of the Ibram X. Kendi book, How to Be Anti-Racist. So the active process of identifying and eliminating racism by changing systems, organizational structures, policies and practices and attitudes so that power is redistributed and shared equitably. I just really wanna emphasize that this is not about how do you be a better person? It's not about personality, right? This is really looking at the system structures, policies, and how we can change those to be more equitable. Diversity is individuals from a variety of backgrounds with specific focus and representation of a plurality of races and ethnicities, and including the intersections of identities such as gender identity, generation, sexual orientation, national status, socioeconomic status, veteran status, disabilities, among others. Equality is the same opportunity offered to everybody regardless of history, prejudice, or other pre-existing barriers. It does not recognize the systems that perpetuate status quo and discrimination toward non-white and other groups. But equity is the promotion of justice, impartiality, and fairness within the procedures, processes, distribution of resources by institutions or systems. Tackling equity issues requires an understanding of the context and underlying or root causes of outcome disparities within our society. Equity ensures that every individual has what they need to be able to fully participate. Inclusion is the degree to which diverse individuals can participate fully in the decision-making processes within an organization or group. And intersectionality, which is Kimberly Crenshaw's term, uh, is used to describe the complex cumulative matter in which the effects of different forms of discrimination combine, overlap, or intersect for women and non-binary people of color. Treating race and gender as mutually exclusive categories invisibilizes those that intersect both, such as Black women. Okay. I'm gonna pause here. Hi, everybody. Does anybody have any questions? Are these terms, I mean, I know these are a lot of the terms that are, are you know, uh, in the ecosystem and in the conversation many of us are having, and I'm wondering if anybody has um, different understanding of the terms or another kind of definition you'd like to bring forward, like diversity and inclusion. Okay. Any Hi, questions? Vanessa. It's Kim Hi, Goodman. Kimberly. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> um, Vanessa was actually here in Ohio with me uh, in the spring, which was so much, so much fun. Um, I know a lot of this work is going on around the country, which I'm, I'm so grateful for. Um, I'm just wondering what you think. How can artists, musicians, in their small microcosm, yeah. affect change? You know, someone, yeah. I'm, I, I, I have the privilege of running an organization. I can affect change from the top, but how could, how could I, a, an individual musician playing in an orchestra or running a private right. studio, how can they affect change, meaningful change? Yeah. Thank you for the question. And actually the, I'll make sure I, I um, bring that forward in the, the next slides. I mean, I think the first thing is this is about people, right? This is about people. So whatever, if it's, if you lead an organization or if you are a musician showing up for an orchestra gig, there are different ways that you can first, you know, observe, obviously, but also ask the questions, right? Even um, maybe intervene if necessary, um, and ultimately continue to learn um, about the experiences of others, so you can be more aware of. Ask them what they need. You know, you can be aware of how you can be most helpful. Let me just uh, show you a little bit more about uh, this context idea as well, because I think understanding the context helps you also. Um, know how to best apply this in any specific situation. So let me show you a little bit more. This is um, a graphic that I took from Team Dynamics, uh, which is one of the places that I was able to get some training from and one of the organizations I work with. And um, it is not to say that any one of these other inequities have, you know, because you're upstairs or downstairs is not meant to be um, intentional, but the point here is that race is the entry. So think about the intersectionality again, um, starting with race. If you look at these other inequities, gender, age, sexuality, 
these are also you know areas where there's discrimination, people are excluded, et cetera. If you add race, if you layer race to any number one of those, any one of those, that is a completely different experience, right? So um, just to put it in a different way, and I bring this up because this comes up often in my experience. People say, but what about you know this or what about me? Because I have, you know, these are all valid inequities and areas where there are systemic issues. However, if you consider your daily interactions and first impressions of people, walking into a store, you know, walking into a, a classroom, um, the first thing we know about people is the visual exterior is race. We see race, you know, I grew up in a generation where we talked about, well, I don't see race. Well, yes, we do actually. <laughs> and, um, and I think we have to just be really, really honest about how that is um, really, really entrenched and embedded in the media and every, you know, every our everyday lives. So like I was saying, layering in that inequity other than race and observe the privilege, no, sorry, so you layer an inequity that is other than race, observe the privilege of whiteness. So, um, I just really want to emphasize this because I hear particularly from um, other women, other white women, you know, but we need to focus on gender. Yes, there's absolute gender inequity, particularly in Western classical music. It is still very much, um, you know, dominated by a white patriarchal framework. Um, however, white women such as myself still have far more privilege than women of color just as an example. So when we say BIPOC and women, actually we mean BIPOC and white women. And he's BIPOC, you probably mostly, you probably know this term, it's just kind of the best term we use now. It's not about perfect either, but it's black indigenous people of color. So just always thinking about those intersectionalities um, as you think about what is, um, you know, what is the system I am a part of? Where are the issues that um, may be um, negatively in, impacting somebody more than me. What is my privilege? Proximity is also a major one. As a white woman, I have proximity with white men all the time. White men, you know, my father, my brother, um, there is a, a comfort because there's that proximity. It is often the case, however, where there is not a proximity to people of, um, of different races, right? different class, different, um, different experiences. And I think not having that proximity also creates um, more of a, um, an othering and a greater obstacle to, again, finding that human connection, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. And ultimately fair systems benefit everybody experiencing inequities and injustice. So one more thing about guilt. <laughs> um, We've actually done a huge uh, workshop on this at ACF with uh, an organization called Innocent Technologies. And I didn't even offer a definition here because there are many definitions, but guilt is something, particularly as a white person, that we really, really need to be aware of because often this is actually what's leading the effort. You, st if you are a white person or anybody, if you are walk walking into a situation where you are trying to affect systemic change and you're doing it because you want to feel better because you want to be absolved because you want to tell me you want somebody to say you're not racist that's not going to be the best motivation that's actually possibly going to cause more harm um so i just invite you to think about what is motivating you and try to objectify the guilt guilt can be helpful it can cause things to happen certainly it should not be the leading reason why you're entering into this particular work Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little about ACF's work, how we, we started here. Um, and then again, I will pause. And if there are questions, I invite you to put them in the chat and Paula can, can interrupt me. Um, so when I started ACF five years ago, it definitely wasn't, you know, we're gonna hire Vanessa and we're gonna do this transformative change and make sure we're centering racial equity. There was definitely a um, an interest in doing some DEI workshops. You know, it was already kind of clear that this needed to be something that, um, Music organizations, well, every organization, but you know, particularly in Western classical music, which is just a component of the musical approaches we include, um, there needed to be more work done. And we actually had some money to do. Um, this was secured before I arrived to do some kind of convening with composers of color. It wasn't really defined what it was. Well, I knew enough to know that 
we were not going to be an organization hosting a conversation about what it was to be a composer of color in our ecosystem if we weren't looking at ourselves first and we weren't starting to do the work. So in my second month, I think, on the job, I hired Justin Lang to work with the organization. And um, he, he worked with board and staff. He also guided the, the creation of this, what ended up becoming this racial equity and inclusion forum, which is still online, you can see it, um, and also helped us put together a statement of commitment that was used as part of this inclusion forum to invite feedback. I think what's really important actually is that we put forward a proposal first. And I would say whether or not you're doing this organizationally, I think putting yourself again in a vulnerable position um, is a really excellent way to invite that feedback. Also pay people if you're if you want them to be on a panel, if you want people to really make their time and use their labor, um, you need to pay them for that, which we did. We created a board equity committee, which is and has been since chaired by Loki Karuna, who's going to be your second um, speaker, which is kind of great uh, in the series. And we set clear and actionable goals, right? This is an iterative effort. So I think really setting those clear and actionable goals enables you to have benchmarks, enables you to um, make progress. And ours are, are five years, what we ended up doing. Um, and we're not going to achieve all of them, but it's setting up um, goals for ourselves, but also accountability for ourselves. We use town hall and other feedback sessions to understand what ultimately was a very large evolution over the course of a year on that statement that is now published on our, on our site. And of course, this has continued to be a commitment throughout board and staff as we recruit new board members and new staff members. This is a, an expectation that you're not only supportive of this work, you are going to engage in this work and it is centered in the work that we do. Um, and again, accountability matters. We have an annual report card um, that Loki and I do each year um, talking about where we are in the work itself. Um, this is just some of the statement um, of commitment. You'll recognize some of this language that I've already mentioned um, and you can go to our site to see it. Um, and maybe I'll actually pause here because I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Kimberly. <laughs> um, let me see, let me see where you all are at. Are you, um, yeah. But I, I thought, you, I think you did. I, yeah. I think you did answer it when, when, because there are ways, there are steps, there are, there's work to do, there's education to get. No, I, th I think you did a beautiful job of, of answering that. I um I wonder. I said, oh, yeah. sorry. I just have a quick question, or I don't know. Can you expand a little bit more, or say a little bit more about um the like report card um yeah. aspect? Um, because again, like we have a DEI statement at NFA, and I feel like uh, you know as a staff, we're actively working on it because I work here, and I can say that as a person of color, I feel like we are and. But um, I would like to see like your thinking about like how you share that with your like members and your audience. For sure. Um, so actually, why don't I drop the link right in the chat? I didn't have it ready. So just give me one moment. Um, so we don't probably have time to get into all of this today, but you know, there are so many challenges with how to do this while maintaining the integrity of people, right? We don't, nobody wants to feel like the checklist, the the number and the thing, and you know, you're doing a grant proposal, you know that, you know, this is just, this is just, uh, you know, part of the, the work. Oh, thank you, Paula. Um, and, um, and it's important because we need to know who's showing up, right? So it's optional, everything we do is optional, but part of our, um, goals is really looking at who's showing up, who's returning, of course, as well. And ultimately, the actions that we take, what is the outcome from those actions? So it's not just like, we're saying these things, we're doing these things, but actually, what happens as a result of that? I think generally nonprofits aren't very good at that. You know, we, we like do all this stuff, but we don't actually know what the impact is. And we don't learn from the impact to be able to then adapt, you know, and do it differently. Um, Actually, we're going to do a, a survey soon for artists um, along these lines as well. 
Um, but you'll see it's, it's kind of a range of things um, that it starts as like major, like um, early on in the pandemic, we actually moved away from a membership model. We were, you know, it was like $70 a year as a composer, you would have access to certain resources on our page. Um, and rather than thinking about like how to increase membership, we thought about actually who is, who is the membership and how does that relate to the people who are engaging with us and the people that are applying to our programs. And there was actually a lot of silo um, happening. And moreover, because people, and still like this is now three years later, still people still think we're a membership organization and therefore don't feel like they can call us, don't feel like they can access our resources. And that's not what we want, right? Um, so it really became more and more in conflict with our, our equity work. So what we ended up doing was move to pay what you can. And even to an extent, and I'll show this a little bit in the presentation too, um, community-centric fundraising is something that we're trying to implement. So it's not a, um, you know, you get these benefits if you give more or we're competing with this other organization, but it's really about how you as a community you know, see the value of the community, right? This is not a, <laughs> this is not a Western European mindset. However, it is about the, the more, I might not get a direct benefit from it, but contributing to the community helps everybody. And the more that we can demonstrate how we are impacting the community, obviously the, the value proposition increases. Um, right, <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, Paula. I guess I was going to ask if there were any like really shocking thing. I mean, you kind of talked about the siloing, um, mm -hmm. but any other big things you kind of discovered and, and, and through like this report card and kind of reporting back and finding. So I, I'm just wondering if there were big yeah. surprises, like things you were like, wow, that's really great. Or things like, oh, we're not doing so hot there. Absolutely. So um, two, two things. One is um, again, with the, just trying to understand who, like who's applying to our program. So we actually look at who is applying as part of our report card, not who won the award. So we also have made massive changes in like the panel process. There's a great uh, resource called Retool um, that Eleanor Savage, you know, runs the Jerome Foundation has created that talks about how to think about the panel process because it's like jury selection, right? The people who are on the jury ultimately are, are what is going to affect the outcome. So it's not about like, this is the quota, <laughs> right? It's about making sure that people around the table reflect as far reaching diverse group as possible. And I would say race obviously being a priority and you know generation, gender, musical approach, location, all those things are things that we are really um, uh, intent on, on creating in addition to creating space for dialogue where a lot can happen actually when these different you know perspectives come together and make decisions. So anyway, um, the the outcome I think is more evident. But who's applying? Who sees themselves as belonging here? And not everybody's going to share their information. That's always been a challenge. Um, so we try to explain why we need it. We're not going to share it out, but it just helps us know how we're doing. Um, that's an ongoing challenge, I think. Um, and and also, what are the things that we want people to self-identify. So what are the different prompts that we have? You know, we try, we have a pretty massive list actually of different race and ethnicities. And even that isn't a perfect system. Like that still needs to be continually adapted. I think that's really hard. The other thing that I guess seems obvious, but <laughs> I still, it still kind of catches me um, by surprise is that um, the, some of these, these, first things like, okay, we're not going to do membership anymore. I mean, that was a process, but you know, it was, it was a fairly easy decision. Ultimately, when we, when we decided we were going to do that, um, removing fees is easy. Making up for the removal of fees is hard. And importantly, all the really, really, you know, internal things that happen um, afterwards. So, you know, there's like staff reviews, um, you know, even uh, when we're recruiting new staff, what goes in the job description? How do we set up staff meetings? You know, now that we have people from many different, you know, communication preferences. I mean, there's so many day-to-day -day things that you don't even, um, you don't realize actually continue to again, go back to that default of how we were trained as, you know, Western classical musicians. 
Um, and it's not a, just about the checklist and the objective, it's, it's actually creating space um, for these differences and um, really understanding how to ensure that people feel like they can bring these differences you know, into the room. Those are the things that I guess I didn't really, I was ignorant about, right? I didn't really understand as we kept going further and further into this, that there's so many layers. Um, and ultimately I feel like I'm just trying to unlearn as much as learn most of the time. And that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it really takes commitment because I have the privilege to opt out if I wanted to. Right. And that's, that's, you know, that's something I have to understand too. So Vanessa, there was another question in the chat there. It's a two part question. So I'll ask the first part. Um, the first part is how do I, as a head of a 300 member organization, mm -hmm. invite a more diverse population? Okay. Oh, these are good questions. Okay. Let's get into it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the short answer is there's no one thing, right? Um, there, as, as I had in an earlier slide, I think the, the major thing is the consistency and continuing to look at all the different layers of the organization. And I think it seems obvious, but worth saying, it isn't just about hiring or bringing on the board, you know, different people of color, because they, because the organization needs to make sure the agency is there, you know, who's actually making the decision, the systems need to be set up so that they can be successful. Um, and there needs to be a general awareness of, oh, sorry, I'm freezing, but hope you can hear me. Um, there needs to be a general awareness of um, what we're doing and why. Again, not because you feel guilty or like, oh gosh, you know, shoot, we've only had white people doing this for 30 years, you know, guess we should change that. I mean, it needs to, it, it requires so much more care. So I would say there's, it's always a good time to start the conversation. Um, there's, um, there, people are always gonna enter the conversation from different places and different spectrums, different forms of understanding. Um, and absolutely start looking at, for example, you could look at committees where um, you could bring in people who are not in the organization, you know, start creating different spaces in which you can, you can very humbly say, we want this change, we need your help. And like I said, start with being vulnerable yourself and pay people. <laughs> and I think maintaining that commitment over time um, that is what is going to start to move the needle. Then you build out like, what does it actually look like? What are some objectives for this committee? What are some objectives for this year? Be realistic, but stretch yourself and learn along the way, right? Something we do, I think also as part of our Western European thing <laughs> is be very goal oriented, right? Like we've got a concert, we've got you know a paper due. And sometimes it leads us to be just so focused on that end goal that we miss things along the way. And that's something that I've really, really learned about this is sometimes you just need to pause and check in with people and understand why are they disengaged? Why are they not showing up to committee meetings, right? Maybe there's actually some harm being done or maybe they feel uncomfortable or maybe there just needs to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation to understand you know, what is happening. We need to be okay with pausing <laughs> and, and taking time um, and not just being in a rush to do the end goal. Um, yeah. So those are some thoughts, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll share just a couple more slides here and see if that helps answer some things too. Um, just to tell you a bit more about ACF's approach, I mentioned a few of these things, but this is one of our board members, Douglas Kearney. We are engaging in an intervention we approach our work with a recognition of existing systems and affecting the change needed while also designing an alternative model. I mean, we talk about all kinds of different things, but ultimately, you know, this work is it takes time. So acknowledging these existing, existing systems, how can we navigate, how can we help artists navigate within those systems? For example, I have a director of digital media who uh, just joined us and talks a lot about how the Google search function, like the SEO, right, is, was set up with a white male framework. It's not even something you think about, but what happens 
is that if you as an artist, when I describe your music in, in different terms, um, if you want to, uh, you know, even describe your identity in different terms, that actually can negatively affect the opportunity for your page to show up in SEO search. It's called Algorithms of Oppression is a book that was written about that. We honor people's self-described identities, including how they identify as an artist, how they identify their music. We try to really expand the word composer. Um, and we use the term anti-racist to best illustrate our active commitment to learning, listening, and engaging behavior and actions that eliminate racism. And our hope is to make the circle bigger for more people to belong to our community. It's not an either or. And I have to say that again, because this comes up so often. It's not about who's losing out <laughs> to have others come into the circle, but it's a yes and. We just need a bigger circle, right? Yes, there will be some, um, in order to create a more equitable space, there will be a decrease in access for some people in order to make space, but it doesn't mean that you have to completely, I mean, we all need to be part of that ecosystem. That circle needs to include everybody, um, but in an equitable way. So it's not this zero sum game, which, which I often hear in some rhetoric in our field. This is an example of, of something that I would put in our um, report card. This was actually from our last report card. Um, ways that we have actions. So we've launched um, Anatomy of a Commission as a project that offers transparency and guidance for an equitable process. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is create transparency. We're trying to offer resources and information and provide examples of what works. I think often people don't know what they don't know, so they're afraid of making a mistake or they're afraid of getting called out, right? Again, we have to be brave. We have to put ourselves forward and ask for feedback. Um, and I think ultimately we need to provide examples of what it can look like so people understand what is missing. I believe in that rather than you know the shaming. I think I think more of a um, graceful, not graceful, but generous approach. Now, if people ignore it, <laughs> and and I've had multiple conversations. Like there's uh, there are times that I've been called by an artist as you know anti-white and like why are you doing this and you know the the things that people do when they are unhappy with these changes um and i you know i really go back to the systems and um looking at we're not uh we're not rigging the system we're actually just creating more transparency in the system and we're bringing more people into the decision making process i talked about the membership program already different things like our criteria for opportunities listings for composers. So we actually don't just put on our page, which is the most visited page on our site, whatever comes our way, we review it. And we also will engage with a programmer, for example, if we feel like it's not a fair opportunity or like the application fee is wildly, you know, too high. And there are still many cases in which, for example, a presenter will do a call for for um, scores, they'll ask somebody to send in a work that has never been performed before or write a work without them even knowing if they're going to get the opportunity. And that is not okay. So we engage in these conversations so that again, people know more what they don't know and also um, hopefully um, you know, consider the changes. Um, another example, sorry. Oh, some pictures of our artists. Yep. So this is one of the partnerships we're doing. We're going to be talking about this at Sphinx if you're coming this week to Detroit. Um, examples of some articles that we do in I Care If You Listen, where we really try to offer the platform for artists to share their, um, their thoughts, um, as well as highlight the different amazing things people are doing. So this is an example of outcomes. These are not numbers I'm very pleased with. <laughs> this is part of the learning, right? This is something that we just offered in the last um, report card um, where we looked at, again, how many people did not share. These are numbers that we're you know, trying to investigate and understand better. Um, and we look at, again, the applications rather than the people who were selected. In the case of composing inclusion, that was only for black and Latin identifying um, composers because Sphinx was the funder, but um, that is that is an uncommon um, 
example because we try to not have any specific um you know racial requirements for any of our awards there are some geographic requirements based on funders but anyway so this helps us just understand like who is showing up who is coming to to work with us and this is just one slice of data right this is not everything there are so many layers to this there are so many contexts to understand but this is one point in which we try to understand the um impact of our work and i would i would add one of the reasons i think it is this is because we had staff change and some of the relationships were not you know continuous these are some of the things we do internally as well like Again, it's looking at every single step. So, for example, we did um, uh, we have we have an endowment, and we renewed our we did a search for a new investment manager. This was part of the the category. And this was what we used in our criteria. We looked at, um, we asked them questions about it. We looked at their statements of equity. We looked at who's the leadership. You know, we made sure that that was a component of our um, process, so that we were fulfilling you know our expectations we even changed like our gift acceptance policy um so that if there is a, a question of whether or not this is um an organization or a person who aligns with our equity goals that the equity committee actually comes in and helps to review that um i'll just offer some resources and i'm happy to share this we can email this around um this is by no means an exhaustive list, but if you're just starting and you want some, some help with some language, with some framework, um, how to be an anti-racist is wonderful, Ibram X. Kendi. Um, white Fragility, I know, is people have a lot of feelings about this book, but I think if you are a white person just starting out, I think it's really helpful to build out the, the bigger framework for, for systemic racism. Um, don't let that be the only book you read, but I do think it's helpful. Um, there's the community-centric fundraising I mentioned, and the 1619 project, I think, is just an example of incredible um, opportunity to understand the historic, the, our background, right? The context, the way in which this country has not reconciled with our past, um, has not been honest about our past, and, and inhibits our ability to really address these issues today. And there's one specifically in music that I very much encourage you to listen to the podcast or read. Um, it's also very helpful in, in thinking about how the Western European um, culture has really impacted um, the history in this country. Um, and white supremacy culture is also extremely helpful. This is the one that talks about this idea of perfectionism and individuality, um, things that we just don't even think about, um, at least I didn't, um, in, my, in, in terms of culture, in terms of how we show up, in terms of how we um, assume people um, may prefer to communicate or engage with us and helps to kind of, you know, just identify some of those things. Okay, let's do one last thing and then we'll open it up and then you don't have to see my slides anymore. Um, I mentioned the guilt, just, you know, I really encourage you to lead with the openness and not the guilt. Remember, this is bigger than you. Um, remember to set goals, but focus on process. Take time, pause if necessary. Remember, impact matters more than intent. And to listen, learn, and keep engaging through the discomfort, but not when you feel you are in a dangerous situation and you are not alone. I see a question. Oh, thank you, Paula. Thank you yeah, sure. I just put that reading list in the chat because you had shared that with me. But um, so I thank you. Thank you so much for um, some a lot of this. I have lots of questions, but I do want to open it up to the group and, and anybody who feel free to put it in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself. You, we're not a, an unruly bunch. So <laughs> if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll go from there. Um, um, Vanessa, oh, sorry, whoever, I can't see who, I'm sorry. Um, um, so I guess I have another question following up on, because this is where I'm at currently is the, I'm curious, like, how often are you surveying um, people, uh, like your, not your members, but people who are using your services? So like, um, I'm like obsessed with data and like making sure that we're really like, 
you know, getting comments from people is like great. And like, that's great feedback, but actually having like real data and like, how often do you recommend doing that? Like, do you do it after every competition or after every, you know, every fiscal year? Like how, how often and how, how maybe some tools on like how you're doing that at your organization specifically to get those numbers that were really great for to see. Yeah, sure. Uh, I should mention to you, I'm not a lawyer and we are in a moment, especially after the Supreme Court ruling against affirmative action that um, there are, I, we don't even know, right? The legal implications of that. So we do have to proceed cautiously. I would definitely consult if you're, um, you know, in, in the way in which you are collecting this data, for example, in hiring staff, I have been advised to not document anywhere, even if somebody self-identifies somebody's race, so that there's no indication that I have hired somebody purely because of their race, which I wouldn't anyway. But it is, it's just, we have to be very careful. However, if there is um, an opt-in, which is what we always do, it's always opt-in and explain how we use it. And I don't share people's names and their, you know, it's also not okay to, <laughs> to share how people identify unless they've said, okay. Um, and don't make assumptions, please. If they say they are a queer artist in their bio, okay, then you can use that. But if they don't, please don't assume. Okay, but in terms of collecting data, for example, we always have it as part of the application process for all of our funding programs. That's what most of the data came from. So that's just on the application form. And we also say, um, we also give people the opportunity to say whether or not they want this to be shared with the panel, which who are not staff, um, or just to have it internal. So it goes both ways sometimes. Um, we obviously can't do it specifically for staff, but we can, when staff has been hired, then we, you know, then we have a, you know, we invite people to tell us how they identify. Same thing with board. Um, I think, um, and I would say just on that note, what we do with the staff and board conversation is talk about our commitment and invite them to share what that means for them, like what their experience is, how does that show up in their work? And it really just helps us understand. I mean, for me, I'm just, I just wanna see that there's a commitment and curiosity and, and eagerness to learn, right? They don't have to like know all the terms and whatever, but I want to make sure that they're going to be game to be part of this um, because then it, otherwise it causes problems. Um, uh, you know, surveys are really helpful. None of us want to do a survey, but if you can do quick surveys and add some incentive at the end of it, you know, free something, you know, that's always useful because, you know, there's so much that is more than a number, right? Um, and it can be easy, like, it can be easy things to um, make it as, you know, um, as easy to fill as possible and also for you to collate um, for your purposes. I think an annual report card has been extremely helpful for us. Um, and like I said, we have five-year goals, but the annual report card really shows incremental change. And actually, I think that has been really helpful in gaining more trust in the work because we're not just like putting it there and forgetting it, right? Set it and forget it. And I'm a child of the 80s, I'm sorry. Um, but also there's consistent attention to it um, and consistent movement. And I think that is important to demonstrate. Uh, Daniel, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering, I tuned in not at the very beginning, uh, but I am wondering if you could say more about the SEO being um, discriminatory, because I've been thinking about that ever since you said it, because it's yeah. not something I was sensitive to, except yeah. that it always perpetuates the status quo, which right. in itself, in many ways, is white male if we're talking, but like, yeah. what are the criteria by which they um, are discriminatory like that? Or what causes it? Right, right. Well, I mean, um, I am also not an expert in this area. So Algorithms of Oppression is a book. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the author, but you can find it on, on Amazon. Um, and actually, our director of digital media is creating a series. Um, and we'll be talking about this specifically so that artists, you know, I think, part of what our work is is so that artists know what what these systems are so you can navigate it and i mean it's not ideal but streaming platforms i mean there's so many different business models how do we know 
how these work so we can at least use it to our advantage while we're trying to build another system. But thank you very much. There it is, Algorithms of Oppression. Read it, share it, and it's going to give you probably more information than I would successfully offer you, <laughs> but okay, thank for you. your question. I think there was a, another question in the chat here. I think. Helen oh, yeah, there is. Um, uh, the second part of Helen um, Spellman's question was, do you feel an organization that says it wants to be anti-racist, um, diverse, equitable, et cetera, should hire mostly white people on their staff and their board? So I would say don't make that your goal. <laughs> I mean, I think if you are anti-racist and and I would define what you mean by diverse and equitable, of course. Um, I think that, like I said, it needs to encompass everything. And what you don't want is to have, you know, the one, if you're an all white board and have invite one black person on the board and they're gonna teach us, that's not okay, right? I would be really con um, conscientious about what the expectations are you know, maybe a first start would be like, what are the expectations of a board right now? Um, how do we look at the engagement of our board members? How do we really think about who are the people that are connected to the work we do who would represent different perspectives and how do we make sure that they feel welcome and continue to feel welcome? Because it's one thing to invite, it's another thing. And that's that whole inclusion aspect of it, right? That you consistently feel like I am welcome here. So I think I would first start with just the, what are the systems that are set up now in terms of the expectations, in terms of how the board meetings are led, in terms of the openness of the people who exist to welcome in different perspectives and then start to build the relationships. The relationships are key here with people that you feel would really help to, you know, add new perspectives and diversify the board and keep checking in with them too. I hope that answers your question. I, I, I kind of wanted to ask a question, I guess, a little bit related to like, uh, Kim had a comment about, you know, you, you said that you've had an experience where someone called you anti-white and you talked a little bit about, uh, you gave the definition of anti-racist, which I thought was really great. And I took a screenshot. Um, I guess that's one of the, I guess, what has been your experience when you talk about anti-racist work? Um, and how people's interpretation of that is, especially in classical music. Yeah, um, you know, even in the definition, it doesn't define race, right? So if you, you're not working off the same de definition of race, then anti-racism can be confusing. It's confusing. Um, and actually, to be honest, we put it forward as a value, core value of the organization. When I was, here on my Zoom in May of 2020 in Minneapolis with literally helicopters flying around my home because because um, I, I live about a mile and a half from where George Floyd was murdered. And we had to go farther than like, yeah, we're committed to equity. No, 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 <laughs> we, we need to commit to more. We need to commit to anti-racism. We are not okay with the systems that have led to this happening. We are not okay with being a part of a community that still, uh, you know, is struggling to figure out how to respond to it. Um, and I absolutely believe, and I know my board and staff do too, that artists are key to us understanding and um, coming together and sharing perspectives and and figuring out a way forward. So um, I guess what I would say is it is not common. I don't see the word commonly used um, in most of our classical music spaces. And I would say too, we have constant conversation about anti-racism is not necessarily racial equity. <laughs> so we get we get into the weeds there too. Now we're talking about decolonizing, like I think Loki's gonna talk about that a little bit too, but you know, we're getting into a whole other set of like uh, layers of this. But um, I think the key aspect of it is again, looking at those systems and processes and it's that it's constant, right? It is a consistent effort to be anti-racist. And yes, anti is a negative connotation, but there's no other way to talk about stopping racism, right? It needs to go against 
what is such a strong inertia in maintaining the status quo. Does that answer your question, Paula? It 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 does. I mean, I think about the the systems that are just so ingrained, like yeah. you just kind of take them for granted. Like this is the my least favorite phrase is this is just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, yeah. um, you know, it can exist in, in a membership organization. It can in, exist in, in, in higher ed. It can exist. It just, yeah. and, and not questioning those systems really right. allows, you know, um, us to perpetuate some of this, these things. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And at the same time, change is inevitable, right? I mean, I know this country at this moment in time is, is at a, yeah, I won't go there. But anyway, um, yes, and it can be iterative, right? So I would say start with where you can control things, build the relationships under, just keep learning, right? Um, Brian Stevenson, who's the head of the Equal Justice Initiative, I've had the opportunity to hear him speak a few times recently, and he talks about learning is an action step. It's not the end, but it is an action step. He also talks a lot about how we have to be honest about the, we have to know the truth of our history to be able to move forward. It isn't until we can really reconcile with how these systems were created, ultimately to maintain a, a you know, a certain demographic and power for us to really understand how to dismantle it. And I absolutely mean dismantle it. And it can be dismantling while creating a new model. So where are the places that you do have power? Where are the places where you can speak up even? Like, why do we do it that way? For example, right now, you may be following the Black Orchestra Network, and they're launching this huge campaign about the tenure process, really bringing to light the fact that there are so commonly in orchestras, a lack of transparency and even what that process is. What are you being evaluated on? What is the communication? You know, how do we even get an audition? You know, if we're not honest about really how people have access and are, are able to be in these positions and able to receive tenure, then we're never going to be able to change it. And again, if we can be transparent, if we can be honest and we can start to look at what if we made these changes, it's going to be fair for more people. It's not just about this one group is going to benefit, right? It's going to be a fair, more transparent process. And that's really much better, isn't it? <laughs> so I, I hope that there are opportunities yeah, it, it's not okay just to say that that's just how it is because that's a clear, you know, it's a clear admission of privilege, right? Because you benefit. Of course, you don't want it to change. But I think there are ways to ask questions, but, but why do we do it this way? What if we did it this way, right? And then if you can build your coalition of people who are also asking the questions and are also bringing forward, you know, some, some ideas, I think, I don't work in academia, so, you know, I, I understand there are specific challenges in academia, but I do believe the collective voice can be very loud. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Um, so I don't work in academia either. I'm mostly involved with composers in various ways. And I found from maybe starting 25 years ago when I was running a new uh, you know, composers competition that almost none of the composers were women. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, maybe one out of every 50. And mm -hmm. I got the impression that very few were non-white as well, although we see names coming in and not photos. And I started talking to my friends who were composers who were women and saying, you know, I know that part of the problem, obviously, um, in the programming and commissions and so on, is that there are way fewer women who are coming out of 12th grade yeah. wanting to go into the composition programs. And yeah. all my friends who were teaching college said, yeah, we see this with the application. So part of the problem is at the roots, not at the flowers. How can we get the teenage girls, the young women, to feel like it's, I mean, it's not like that as far as I know for people writing books, poetry, painting, other creative arts. Conductors, yeah, uh, that's another story. And so I think this is part of what led to, I started 
talking to a lot of people, and of course, I'm not the only one there, you know, everyone was, was birthing this. And here in Philadelphia, there was a wonderful program, many of you probably know about it, that was created by a composer at, I think she was at Temple University in Penn, and it's just blossomed yeah. tremendously. Bush. Yeah. And so those of us who aren't in academia, it's mm -hmm. been my experience that you can reach into it by, if you know what you want to accomplish or advocate, to sort of encourage those people who are in the position to empower them or help them. Yeah. I gave guest talks, like for Aaron Bush, I, I think I still do every year. And I'm not the only one because Erin's terrific. You know, she gets lots of people who say, this is what you have to know about, or this is how you go about it. And it, um, I just wanted to, you know, answer when we're not in academia, we're not out of the picture for academia. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you, so Erin's organization is now called Wildflower. She changed it mm -hmm. uh, recently. And then you may also be aware of Luna Lab, which is a wonderful program that's really been expanding by um, composers Ellen Reed and Missy Mazzoli at the Coffin Music Center in, in uh, New York. And I think um, obviously there's a need, you know, these organizations were created for exactly that reason. And I think, you know, First of all, you know, donate to them, <laughs> support them, make sure people know about them, um, and um, yeah, continue to to support um, and engage people in the in the conversation. Um, I'm going to ask another question, but anybody who should <laughs> um, ask questions, but it's a follow up to Dan Danny's Dorf's question about, and it and it's related to the article, the interview that you did with us. Mm. um about creating a sense of belonging mm. yeah um and how what maybe what are some things that you've been able to do with the american composers forum or you think that we could do in classical music right mm -hmm. so he was talking about how do we get more women be you know as composers and mm -hmm. um and we have conversations about you know cr you know uh creating a sense of belonging and i wonder if you'll talk a little bit about that sure um, there's actually a lot of literature about this belonging um, work in kind of the larger cultural uh, sphere, not necessarily in the Western classical one, but um, yeah, doing some some Google search, you'll see that there's incredible literature on this. Um, as it relates to our our work, um, there there are a few ways to do this. We already know that representation matters, right? If you see yourself on stage, if you see yourself in this role that already gives you a sense of maybe I could do this too. Um, this is one reason, for example, we publish who is on the panel of our funding programs before the applications are due. So you can see who is making the decision basically. I know some don't like to do that, but I think it's really important for people to see the, the breadth of um, you know, perspectives that we are inviting to, to be a part of that. I think it's going back to also that space, that opportunity for human connection you know, it's not just like, okay, you're here, you know, great. Now we're just going to keep moving forward with our agenda. There needs to be an opportunity to, to give people a sense of, of welcome and invitation and orientation, whatever it might be. So if it's somebody that, you know, if it's a student, if it's a new board member, I think it's just so important to make time for understanding what their perspectives are and what their preferences are. Even just like, do you prefer email or phone calls? You know, these are different things that we need to take the time to understand about people because actually it isn't always the same. We have multiple, you know, cultures represented in Western classical music and um, multiple ways in which people engage in the art even. So, and I froze again, but um, I think it's creating that space and then checking in. So maybe it's a, thank you, Kimberly. Maybe it's a survey. Um, if you're dealing with a large group of people as we are, we have you know hundreds of artists who we engage with every day, but we also have hundreds of artists that m different members of our staff and board engage with every day and talk about ACF and understand where there may be gaps and understand where maybe we need to do better, understand where maybe I you know caused um, somebody to feel unwelcome. I think we need to just create that space for dialogue because no one person represents a community and no one, you know, touch point is going to give you all the information you need. Hi, Vanessa. Hey, Jen. Um, I was, uh, this is such, this is such a great talk. Um, thank you so much for being here. 
I um, have a couple of things, but one of the things I wanted to ask earlier on was when you were talking about um, the different areas that we need to be aware of, um, whether it's race, gender, sexuality, and then you mentioned socioeconomic class. Um, you know, I, I just finished uh, the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, and, and so those things kind of came up to me about um, people being in different classes, different socioeconomic classes, and how that intersects um, with with issues involving race and equity and how you know institutions and organizations like the NFA that are trying to be more accessible and, and reaching out to more people and um, by being more accessible, making it more affordable, et cetera, et cetera, how that, how that sort of intersects with these ideas and how maybe it's separate from these ideas. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, how the socioeconomic status of somebody may be an intersectional mm -hmm. aspect of engagement or not, you mean? Well, yeah, both. So, you know, by by um, offering more. So, for example, the NFA um, mm -hmm. has we offer now a lower income membership rate to right. sort of increase the sex accessibility overall. Yeah. Um, and whether that has any effect on the, the nature of our membership. Um, but then also, I feel like I've come across with people, especially in my past, who um, feel that the ideas or people who are in a lower social social economic class suffer from the same kinds of discrimination mm -hmm. um and should be sort of considered you know for for certain programs and things like that right, right. So that's kind of where i'm coming from yep so money is complicated right money slash power is complicated and um Yes, the like we we found this with the membership um, changing from our membership structure, um, and actually that's where we started to create this belonging language. While um, a fee, you know, our financial obligation is definitely um, an obstacle. It could be, you know, it, it represents many things for somebody. It's sometimes not even just about the money, right? It can be. Um, it, it, just because of somebody's socioeconomic status doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to pay the 30 bucks for the whatever, right? I, so I, again, context, like we have to think about what is it that we're offering? What is the value proposition? What is it that we are expecting people to to show up, um, being able to, to offer and engage? And um, I think the more that we can consider that, that's going to mean different things for different people. Definitely different fees is 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 useful. And, and similarly, we um again talk with a bunch of different people who offer opportunities for composers about that fact because you know if you're charging this crazy application fee, I understand you have to pay for your operating budget budget, but it shouldn't be at the cost of these artists, you know, who are trying to get, especially emerging artists who are just trying to get like, you know, their work started. Um so. That's a good question. Yeah, I think it just it's needs hard. To, yeah, it is hard. I mean, Missy Mazzoli talks about this a lot. Um, as as a as a as a white woman who grew up in in a rural location in Pennsylvania, and you know, she sees it as often just so expected. I mean, composers are some of the most educated. There's there there's research that shows are some like the number of composers with PhDs. And the average um, salary of fifty thousand dollars from composing is like, you know, crazy. And that, you know, that's a privilege too. How, if you are coming from a lower socioeconomic bracket, how do you even begin that journey? I think we need to also think about what that means in terms of academia. You know, the access to academia. So when you're thinking about representation on your panel, consider that aspect of who's going to be on your decision making group if if these are people that um yeah i would just say make that as part of the intersectional um aspect of how you're bringing people into the conversation sorry that's the best i can offer i think i have a question about the public you just mentioned the publishing of the who was on the panel before the review process and we just talked about this this year um when we were thinking about uh, the review committees for proposals, like for the convention, and should that group of people, further than just the program chair and the assistant, be publicized? Yeah. 
and decided not to publicize it because we didn't want those people to be inundated with nudges, you know, um, and that that probably wasn't something that we should put that, but that they should appear in the program book later, like who was on the programming committee. Um, so I'm just wondering how you get around those fears and what has happened as a result of it, of publishing yeah. the panels. Yeah, um, so it actually hasn't been, this is what I've often heard is, is the reason why not to share a panel um, list, but it actually has not been an issue. I mean, it hasn't been enough that uh, panelists have said, you know, no. And I think it's worth the risk for the sake of transparency. Any other questions? I'm curious if there's anything else that comes to mind when you think about things that felt like the there was a lot of barrier to doing them because of the what ifs that might happen and have those uh has the have those fears turned out to be um in fact what happens <laughs> and it's challenging or or maybe if there's anything else that stands out where the fear hasn't been uh a problem i, I don't know if my question was so clear but um uh, um it for this example that you just gave of of there's this is given as uh the reason frequently for not publishing um panels or or um or decision makers um mm -hmm. and the fear of them being harassed and, but it it's panned it's turned out that it hasn't been a significant issue at least not one that keeps people from um participating in that role are there other things where the fear seemed really big of what might happen but it turns out that it was okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, from from the the, the highest level, uh, there was a lot of fear when I jumped really into the deep end with Justin Lang and whatever third month of my my time at ACF, where we didn't just you know we're just going to do a DEI workshop and we went into it right. We really, um, we really were clear that this was meant to frame the work of ACF. And there was a lot, there was definite pushback um, from various places, not, I mean, internal and external about yes, but, right? Like, yes, that's important, but what about, you know, what about women? What about gender equity? Or what if we lose members? Or um, what if we lose funders? Mind you, this is 2019. <laughs> this is before George Floyd's murder. Um, and and I'm really proud actually that we were doing this already. Um, but the um, the concern of what are we losing, right? Is that zero sum game kind of mentality again, right? What are we giving up to do this can be incredibly um, debilitating, right? That keeps us from doing so much. Frankly, you know, sometimes uh, in language matters a lot too. Like sometimes I'm really <laughs> scared about what I'm putting out into the world and oh my goodness, like what is, what if there's, you know, a huge backlash, you know, again, the feeling of something, what if I say something wrong? I have definitely said something wrong often, right? I would probably watch this in a year and be like, oh my goodness, <laughs> what was I saying? Like, I've learned so much since then. I mean, it, it is a constant evolution and learning moment. And I think ultimately, I mean, obviously we, we pushed forward to answer your question and I didn't have um, people directly say, well, I'm like leaving the ACF because this is, you know, I don't believe in this. I mean, I had a lot of people unsubscribing from the newsletter and things like that, but, um, but the people that stayed were committed. And I was able to then add people like on the board and staff who came, who I was just honored that they would even, you know, want to be a part of it. Like they could be doing this work in a lot of places, Loki, Karuna included. Um, and they saw the work we were doing and the, the genuine commitment behind it and wanted to be a part of it. So I would say usually it's a good idea, <laughs> even if, you know, you're not sure. Um, it doesn't mean do it like, you know, again, don't do it with like just with the end game, do it while collecting information, you know, along the way, that process is really important. Another smaller example is 
with our Innova uh, record label, typically we've had people submit and then the staff would decide and they would let them know if you're on the label or not. Well, that's obviously not very transparent either. Um, and it also at the time required a fee of $3,500 to ACF. Um, so making that transition into a panel process was, you know, it took a while, um, uh, both explaining why we were doing that and also telling some artists who've been on the label for years, like, no, we're actually gonna put this in a panel process. It's not really gonna be up to us anymore. Um, you know, that's very challenging for people. Um, and we just kept framing it with, and here's why, you know, the transparency, the ability for us to bring other people in the decision-making process is going to introduce us to, to more artists. I mean, just really sticking with, this isn't personal. <laughs> this is the framework, right? This is the organizational value system that we're just really trying to align ourselves with. Um, I have another um, it's kind of a big question. So if you have a shorter answer, that's fine. But just um, how, I mean, I hear snippets of like how you're doing this just like throughout your fiscal year. And so I think for me, um, the challenge is um, we, you know, our main thing that we do is we put on this big convention and there's so many moving pieces mm -hmm. to putting that on. And um, how, do we, do we, um, like as a staff, as a staff member, like how do I center like DEI work in, in all the steps and it doesn't get lost in like just the day-to-day -day, like grind that we, have to, you know, we have a deadline in August <laughs> that 5,000 people are going to show up and we have to be prepared. And so folk, you know, doing all that and then not like losing any of the, this DEI stuff within that. Right. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I, I totally understand um, and, and, you know, most nonprofits, we don't have enough staff and we're always, yeah, all that stuff. Right. Um, so I think the more that you can take that, just take that moment and think about like, okay, if we're inviting, if we're inviting speakers, oh, geez, I love how I keep freezing on some great shots. Um, we're inviting speakers. Um, who are we inviting? You know, just taking that extra moment of like, okay, let's actually really think about we've always invited this person, but what if we tried to get somebody who represents a different perspective or that perspective, or um, maybe I should get some, you know, ideas from somebody about that particular, um, you know, session. Um, so that's, that's number one, you know, just kind of first thinking about the who, but then also the how, like, are there ways in which you could provide more accessibility in terms of, you know, in terms of visual or um, hearing um, impaired people? Is there um, language that would be helpful to revisit and bring in a few different people to look at it with you um, in terms of like how you're describing the session? Um, is there uh, something with the the infra like the, the website, right? In terms of how people find the information or what it looks like, is the text, you know, a good color? Um, I think there are multiple ways and, you know, we can't solve this all overnight, but I think just trying to take that extra step. This is, this is what I've learned anyway. You're not going to be able to get it all right all at once. And I've, you know, definitely made some bad decisions as well. But I think taking the space, trying not to be in a hurry, um, inviting feedback, inviting more people into it, and just being really intentional about who you're bringing into the room and how can really change the conversation. I know, easier said than done. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I think we've definitely like we're on the journey of doing that. And I'm very grateful that, you know, this organization really prioritizes that. It's one of the reasons why I really wanted to work here. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it can be it can be tough um, just like in the day to day, the emails and the things. And so but yeah, thank you. Thank you. For your answer. And just don't feel like you have to do it alone. Right. That That's the important thing. Um, I, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, because you mentioned it before we got yeah. on and um, and then because of um, you mentioned it in the article that the interview that in the court uh, Flutus quarterly um, about this idea of knowing when to step up and knowing when to step back and you can talk about the example I don't I don't know what it was that you were you mentioned earlier yeah. but, um, you know how how can people be in this work 
and feel like they're doing it, but they don't have to like lead, you know, so I think, you know, my question, but. Yeah. I mean, this is tough. This is like, I think one of the, for me, one of the hardest aspects as a white woman where I'm still trying to like, you know, use my voice, honestly, I, oh, Jen knows my, Jen's known me a long time. So she knows there have been very dominant men in my life that I, you know, I, I really took time for me to find my voice and use my platform. And also I have a lot of privilege, right? I, I do have um, a platform. I do have some power. I mean, like, depends on what, what we're talking about, but, you know, I'm the executive director of an organization, so there's power, right? Um, so really understanding when it's important that I intervene and speak up or connect or gather, facilitate, or when I just need to shut up and listen, right, um, is sometimes not clear. And um, I think that uh, facilitation is actually the really key aspect of it, which is even if you're not like the chair of the of the you know group, um, it's still important that we are all kind of observing people's involvement. Like I'm sure you've all noticed at some point somebody tends to interrupt a lot or somebody tends to talk a lot longer than everybody else. We we have these, you know, different um uh relationships with space. So um, something that happened recently that Paula was referring to is I was part of a, a group conversation. I had not expected to be the facilitator naively. Um, it was majority white, but not by much, um, different generations for sure. And, um, the conversation started to talk about identity and very quickly went into what does it mean? What does my racial identity mean for how I want to be seen as an artist? And it was clear that there needed to be some support and <laughs> ensuring that it didn't go in a direction that was going to be harmful for people, but also the particularly the people of color who wanted to share their experience were heard and not refuted because it can be very subtle but somebody can say like look I really felt like I was not given this opportunity for this reason and somebody could say yes but blah 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 right that is that small little thing is um incredibly harmful yes and would be <laughs> so much better so no yes buts however I think in my effort to um, encourage them to share their story, I, I, I took um, too much of the space. I think I didn't let them have enough support to be able to have the conversation themselves. You know, I was trying to be helpful, but I actually, I think I stepped on their toes. I think I, I got in their way ultimately. Um, but I had a conversation with, with the people who I'm talking about now afterwards, and um, it was a very productive conversation. I asked for feedback, right? And I learned from it. And also, I think other aspects of the same conversation where I got involved helped to kind of uh, pivot <laughs> some of the conversations that folks were saying in an effort to say, yes, but 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 what about me? Um, in a larger context that enabled us to kind of find a, a, a shared goal again. It's a give and take. It's just a constant thing. And and again, it's very hard when you're stepping into a group where you don't have the relationships um, to establish that trust. There, There's a lot of you know literature out there about how to facilitate conversations that don't start with like the agenda today, but really like how do we connect as people? If we had fewer people, I would have wanted to like hear what everybody's favorite season is, for example, you know, um, just how do we find those opportunities, even in this virtual space, to feel like there's a connection so that we can be um, able to have that back and forth. Thank you.
Well, we have a few more minutes. So if there are any last questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. I'll just say one more thing. Um, thank you for just talking about the importance of transparency. It's, I mean, we all know it's important, but you know how how really critical it can be to to also because it also helps send the right um, give the right perception right to the constituents that you know you're 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 trying to be as fair and equitable as possible and um, and that and and it, it also kind of remind me of. And this is something just more for the group than, than necessarily a question. Um, I was just reminded of um, our friend Weston Sprott. He talks about um, the blind about blind auditions, and you know, for him, he feels that you know we should not take the screen down because you know that's what promotes these ideas and and actually is goes against everything that we've been trying to do for 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 equity but keeping the keeping the the screen up for auditions actually is yeah. the most equitable thing for everybody yeah yeah and i mean yes <laughs> he's written extensively on this and i know that he and many many of our shared friends believe this uh as well um and and they are adding you know more context to that in the sense that it is and it, it shouldn't just be that audition that you know how perfectly you play those excerpt there should be more components of mm -hmm. the process, um, which is part of what what Bon is talking about Black Orchestra Network is talking about too. And <laughs> I would love for there to be part of the conversation about the jury, like who's who's selecting these artists. Are how can we be? I know you have to have you know, the principal flute player, you have like, there's certain things that you have to do. Are they doing any implicit bias training? Like, how do we make sure that that discussion process, because I mean, I'm not running an orchestra, but to me, I actually think that if we'd spent more time on the larger context, which I don't know that we can with orchestra musicians, but um, understanding bias, understanding all these things that we're talking about, creating a better, you know, panel process, then at the end of the day, when someone is offered the job, we already know, you know, what their race is or not even offered the job sometimes, right? But just like the last person standing, we've already understood our own subjectivity and bias because it's still there. Even in a blind audition, it's still going to be there. It's just going to show up in a different way later, right? And you probably already know that some of our friends in the Met Opera Orchestra did experience a very horrific you know, event a few years ago, um, because there was, you know, there were some, because the culture is not that, <laughs> because they haven't had those conversations. I mean, it's the same in academia. I mean, yeah. it has different cloths and different, different forms, but um, I don't know. We like to think that we're more equitable because we, we interview the person and we look at all these different factors, um, but, you know, it's got its problems too so yeah and and just one more like soapbox thing for me is um this idea of excellence you know we talk about achieving excellence in classical music all the time but that too is subjective right i mean sure like playing in tune may be objective to an extent but beyond that it's actually very very subjective and we'd like to think that it's not but in fact i you know i think if we really really drill down into that, we would find that people actually interpret that differently. And I think the more that we can understand that we are human and we are going to have our own perspectives and we are going to be flawed, um, the more we actually can create a much fairer process for everybody. Um, I think one of the things like this committee in particular has changed many in many iterations over the year and and one of the things that we really want to see is in the organization is more transparency about a lot of things mm -hmm. and um, and because I I had I was familiar with the American Composers Forum and I had seen sort of your report card you know and we've tried to do some of that um, and I think our committee just wants more. <laughs> So, you know, this is, the, this is part of 
um, you know, talking to you, talking to Loki, talking to Kevin, are it's part of what we hope will also change some of, of the conversation. I appreciate that. I, I hope what I've offered has been helpful and Loki is definitely going to be amazing. I'm so grateful to have done really almost all of this work alongside Loki and, you know, the, the, he's trusted me, um, through many different things to, you know, to work, to work on this together. Um, and Kevin actually is also part of the ACF board, um, more recently. So I love that ACF just happens to be a through line <laughs> through these three speakers. So I look forward to how they're going to contribute to the conversation too. Well, I think there aren't any other questions and we're at our time. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone joining us and let's give um, Vanessa a round of applause. Um, it's, and thank yeah. you, thank you for kicking us off. I think it, it was a really great way to do it. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for a wonderful conversation. I really learned a lot and I'm sure uh, we have a lot to do. And um, I think what's really important is the willingness willingness to listen and learn and, and um, keep moving forward. And thanks to Paul and the committee for, for putting these together. I think it's really important work. And and so yes, applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I did put in the chat um, our link to the rest of our speaker series, if you wanna go ahead and register tonight um, via Zoom again and Thank you again to everybody who joined us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, or Paula, or I guess Vanessa <laughs> too, if you're open to that. Um, and thank you again. I hope you all have a great evening. And thanks to Melly for being a great host as well. <laughs>